Jera then plays an excerpt from the 1999 BBC documentary The Planets, Episode 4, that shows one popular theory on how the moon was formed by a Mars-sized planet impacting with the Earth. I won't bore you by playing the whole segment. No one is bored by the segment, just you. And for those who, unlike you, have an attention span long enough to hear material which doesn't support your case, allow me to play it. This clip is very relevant, and Webb simply chooses to ignore it because his not including the clip becomes the foundation of a straw man that he's about to build. The moon rock was almost identical to the most basic kind of rock on Earth. It was basalt, which forms when molten rock from inside a planet seeps through the surface, then cools and solidifies. When we got the rocks back from the moon, we saw that the um, isotopes of oxygen in the lunar rocks were exactly the same as on the Earth. Now the reason this is important is that we have meteorites from other parts of the solar system and each other part of the solar system has a different composition of these oxygen isotopes, ratio of one type of isotope to the other. The moon has exactly the same as the Earth. So that seemed to rule out the idea that the moon had formed far away and it made it much more plausible that the moon was something made out of the same material that the Earth was made out of. But if the moon was made from the same stuff as Earth, there were still puzzling differences. Jay Maloche was one of a team of scientists struggling to make sense of it all. I think probably the most prominent thing about the lunar rocks is they're so dry. There's not a single molecule of water, as far as we can tell, in any of the lunar rocks. And that kind of amazing fact strongly supported the idea that the moon must have come from someplace else. If it had been spun out early in the Earth's history or grown together with the Earth, you'd expect it to have water in it. And yet, other facts suggested that the moon could not possibly have come from somewhere else. That kind of, of conflict among facts was what led scientists to be very confused at that time about the origin of the moon. Scott and Irwin had found a piece of rock sparkling with mineral crystals. Okay, let me get a picture. It was as old as the Earth, four and a half billion years, and it came to be known as the Genesis Rock. It was not basalt, but a anorthosite, a much more complex rock. Geologists knew that the only way this rock could have formed was if the moon had once been completely molten. But a body as small and cold as our moon should never have been that hot. The moon's birth grew ever more puzzling. None of the missions had provided a blueprint for the moon's formation. But they had shown that it was as old as the Earth. It was made of the same rock, but it had no water. And it had once been completely molten. What could explain all these facts together? By the early 1970s, fresh ideas were emerging about the origins of all the planets. The early solar system was thought to have been a violent place, with many bodies growing rapidly and competing for space. These new theories led William Hartman to look again at the evidence from the lunar missions he came up with an intriguing idea for the moon's origin. When the Earth was forming, it wasn't the only object at that distance from the sun. And the second biggest object actually got very big. And eventually, fairly late in the process, when the Earth was partly grown, uh, crashed into the Earth and blew a lot of material out of the Earth. So the moon then grew from that debris swarm around the Earth. Hartman suggested that in its early history, the Earth had crossed paths with a world the size of Mars. Somehow, Earth survived the collision. The swirling mass of debris coalesced to form the Moon. To many scientists, Hartman's idea seemed almost too far-fetched to believe. 
When I first heard about this theory that Bill Hartman had put forward, my first reaction was almost shock. I didn't believe it. I was pretty sure that uh, in a weekend I could do uh, a few calculations and show that uh, what they had proposed simply couldn't work. In fact, it took work with the biggest military computers to try to fill out the holes in this theory and begin to realize that really it could work after all. The more people considered it, the more Hartman's theory seemed to fit all the known facts about the moon. If it was born from the Earth, its rock would be the same. The heat of the collision explained why the moon was once entirely molten, and any water in its rocks had vaporized. But as we've just demonstrated, there is indeed water in the moon rocks. Two objects colliding together would certainly have explained the identical materials, but how could water possibly have survived such a violent explosion? In case you didn't catch on, let's summarise. As stated in the show, and as shown by our comparison of Big Muley and the Earth basalt derived JSC-1 lunar regolith simulants, Apollo samples have a chemical composition near identical to that of Earth their main component being SiO2, or silicon dioxide. As William Hartman and Larry Taylor both assure us, the oxygen isotopes are identical in both the Apollo samples and Earth rocks. The Apollo samples have always contained copious amounts of water, that until recently, NASA has tried to dismiss as terrestrial contamination. The entire giant impact theory is busted, because it was built on the two simple facts that moon rocks are the same as earth rocks and that they have no water. The former characteristic still stands true, but the latter is long dead. I won't bore you by playing the whole segment, but Jera follows it with an interview from the same documentary where geologist Dr. William Hartman discusses oxygen isotopes. When we got the rocks back from the moon, we saw that the um, isotopes of oxygen in the lunar rocks were exactly the same as on the Earth. Now the reason this is important is that we have meteorites from other parts of the solar system and each other part of the solar system has a different composition of these oxygen isotopes, ratio of one type of isotope to the other. The moon has exactly the same as the Earth. So that seemed to rule out the idea that the moon had formed far away and it made it much more plausible that the moon was something made out of the same material that the Earth was made out of. The operative word, or phrase in this case, is oxygen isotope ratio. What exactly is Dr. Hartman saying? Well, in eighth grade, we learned that the number of protons in an atom determines what element it is. Each and every element then has one or more isotopes, determined by the number of neutrons. Oxygen, for example, has three common isotopes found in all rocks. Plain Joe Oxygen 16, and his two chubbier brothers, oxygen-17 and oxygen-18. By plotting the ratios of the two heavier oxygen isotopes to oxygen-16, we find that rocks that originate from different regions of our galaxy have different ratios of these oxygen isotopes. Earth rocks and moon rocks fall along the same line on this plot. Does that prove that earth rocks and moon rocks are identical? No but it does give scientists a dictionary split that they can use to distinguish earth rocks and moon rocks from rocks originating from other parts of our solar system. You can see why Webb chose to leave out the BBC clip I showed in my video. As we just saw, the oxygen isotope ratios are only one of the many similarities between moon rocks and earth basalts. Both have the same oxygen isotope ratios. Both have virtually the same chemical compositions. Both have the same minerals, both are the same age, and both have significant quantities of water. Webb simply focuses only on oxygen isotope ratios, ignores all the other similarities, and alleges that I think earth rocks and Apollo samples are the same simply because they both have the same oxygen isotope ratios and only the same oxygen isotope ratios. I said no such thing. I said that the Earth rocks and Apollo samples are the same because they both have the same oxygen isotope ratios, virtually the same chemistry and minerals, and both have water. 
Can you say fallacy of omission? Can you say straw man? I can. Throughout his critique series, Webb repeatedly tries to downplay the similarities between the two and allege that the only thing they have in common is water, which he pathologically downplays, and oxygen isotopes. That's not critiquing someone's videos, that's called lying. And there's more on the way. To supposedly strengthen his claim that moon rocks are actually earth rocks, Jarrah quotes from a National Geographic children's book. The National Geographic Picture Atlas of Our Universe may be heavily illustrated, but Webb is the first person I've heard to describe it as a children's book. The book itself is crammed full of extremely detailed information about astronomy and astrophysics. It even contains a section about Einstein's theory of relativity. They don't teach that until university level. School children are only taught simplifications of the basics. 